Hello and greetings, I'm Slippery Pete, and welcome to my first video in a series about an interesting game that's consumed much of my spare time over the past couple of months, called War in the Pacific Admirals Edition. It's an obscure game, and by obscure I mean as of this recording, in the Facebook Favorite Games section there are a total of five people who list it, myself included. With some simple division, that means that one out of every 100 million people like it. So obviously it's not for everyone, for reasons I'll get into later on, but that doesn't make it any less cool. And I learned about this game through a uh, forum that I lurk, where a poster was doing a playthrough where he'd post one turn, or one day in the game, per day in real life. And of course he started on December 7th. Uh, once I caught up with this post, I was interested enough to give it a try myself. And unfortunately I couldn't find any place that had anything more than screenshots of the game in action before I bought it, so I'm making this video to show any would-be buyers of War in the Pacific uh, just what it looks like and, uh, and how it behaves. So I'll make a series of these videos, and hopefully I won't need any more than three, to show off how a turn resolves in the game as well as what's involved in giving orders to demonstrate its complexity and maybe give new players sort of a clue how to play, because it's really intimidating when you first start. And first I'll give a little bit of background about the game. Um, War in the Pacific is published by Matrix Games, which is a purveyor of a genre known as Grognard Games. Pardon the botched pronunciation, I took German rather than French as my foreign language. But uh, I'm told it's a term used originally in the Napoleonic era to describe grumbling veterans, but in modern context it describes obnoxiously serious war gamers. How obnoxious? Well, a poster somewhere on the internets claimed that a grognard friend of his refused to play Napoleon Total War because the buttons on the uniforms were, quote, all wrong. So, in short, they're sticklers for detail and accuracy in their war games. Many of these games are evolved versions of their 1970s board game counterparts, which is what huge nerds rolled dice over before Dungeons & Dragons was invented. And these games, uh, these computer games replace real dice rolls with virtual ones, and due to the power and speed of computers, allow for a great deal more of them. However, the simple, minimalist graphics remain, and you'll see that shortly. Nextly, Grognar games have an obnoxious tendency to be crazy expensive relative to mainstream games. This game costs $90 most of the time, as you can see the boxed edition here. Um, and even though I nabbed it on sale a few months ago for $65, but when even Blockbuster games sell for $60 new and as low as 10 or 20 if they're on clearance, it's quite a premium, especially for something that looks like this. Um, so where does the cost come from? Well, first off, there's sort of the niche audience. And secondly, development teams place a really high value on the research they do to model everything that might appear in the game, and as well as on the scope of the games they make. And uh, probably during these, uh, these videos, you'll see just how big the scope this, of this game is. Anyway, I'll fire it up and uh, load my save to show you all what's up. For folks familiar with the game, I'm playing Scenario 1 as the Allies. For everybody unfamiliar, uh, this scenario covers the entire Pacific theater of World War II, so you have um, India in the west, and the west coast of North America in the east. Um, and it has accurate orders of battle for both the Allies and Axis. And um, for when I mention Scenario 1, there are also other scenarios covering both smaller historical campaigns like Guadalcanal or the Battle of the Coral Sea, as well as what-if scenarios such as uh, what if Japan was a bit better prepared for the war, give it, and that gives them more army units and fuel reserves, and I think uh, another carrier or two. So, now that you see the playing field, no, my graphics card isn't broken. This is actually how the game looks. I wasn't kidding when I said board game. So, I guess I'll point out a few very basic features and let you know my plans, and then run the turn. First, if you're interested in military history, you're probably wondering how I'm doing. So this is the uh, large strategic map, and I'll turn off everything except bases that everybody controls, so you kind of have an idea of who controls what areas. Uh, right now in the game, it's um, in May 1944, so um, as you can see, I sort of opted for an ahistorical um, liberation, you might say, of Pacific Ocean areas, and concentrated it on the oil-producing areas in uh, Malaya, Sumatra, and Java. And 
as I said, it's May 1944, so even historically, Japan kind of knew it lost the war, and um, they're only carrying on to try and win the least harsh of peace possible for itself. A, historically, however, I've sunk every single one of their carriers, and I believe all of their battleships, at the loss of one escort carrier to some jerk submarine out there. So, you might wonder how I did so well. I'll admit I was safe scumming early on, but that's only fair when your carriers get jumped and you haven't figured out how to set up combat air patrols and assign bomber groups to, correct, uh, to attack correctly yet. So what I'm doing this turn is using the Americans to land a large force at Luzon in the Philippines. You can see my task forces here. And meanwhile, the British and Indians have recaptured Singapore. And they have a number of air bases in range to uh, neutralize most of the major air bases in Vietnam and Thailand. And my overall goal is to secure a reasonably good supply line from, um, you know, India or the U.S. and sail some ships up through here and then land them at ports in China. Because um, even though I do have the Burma Road open, it's China's still pretty starved for supplies. So uh, that'll, once China's resupplied, that'll help me uh, clear up a lot of um, strongholds in here and hopefully get a lot of victory points um, to win the game and maybe potentially end the war before 1945, but more on victory conditions later. Uh, just some general UI notes so you know what you're looking at. Uh, these hexes with, well, this game is, first of all, hex-based. You can see me kind of clicking around and uh, highlighting some of them. Um, hexes with a flag on it denotes a base and who controls it, so uh, this hex here that I have highlighted um, belongs to China, and uh, this one here is a base controlled by Japan. Um, you can build airfields and ports at these uh, at these bases, well ports only on uh, bases adjacent to a coast. Um, and a hex with Kind of this cross in the upper right hand corner uh, that denotes there's an airbase and if you mouse over the uh, little airbase icon there you can see all of the uh, all of the air groups that are currently located at that base um see if i can find a port to show you uh, here singapore will work uh, there's like a little ship's anchor in the top left of a hex if you mouse over that you can see all the uh, ships in port. It doesn't give you the names of the ships, but it'll tell you what class they are. We have a battleship, a battle cruiser, some heavy and light cruisers, and destroyers, and auxiliary ships all uh, all docked there. And let's see, there's also a sm small dot bases that exist, and those are basically bases that um, you know haven't been developed at all yet, So, but they can be. You, know, you can see this one has uh, can support a decent sized airfield and I'll, uh, I'll explain more about the sizes of base structures and things like that later on because it's a little complex now um, and finally you might notice um, these little squares with an X through them those are um, land combat units or army and marines and and the likes even support units the downside is you can't really tell from the map how strong uh, your forces are too well if you mouse over you get this big list of um, the units you have in the hex and they give you sort of this weird shorthand that I don't quite understand yet I think a stands for assault value and uh, s stands for support <coughs> excuse me and a few other things, but I'll get into what all that means and try and parse it myself uh, in the next videos in this series. So now that you kind of know what's going on, I'm going to run my turn and um, also put my written introduction to the side. I haven't run this turn yet, so I have no idea what's going to happen. What I intend to happen is the American forces land here at a base known as Naga, and I uh, got couple carrier groups to support this and uh, also some transports with you know land-based air that can help out as well anyway without further ado I will end the orders phase and run the turn so the first thing it does it saves the game sort of as a backup in case you get kicked out early yeah you know, the game crashes or something on you 
Um, next thing is the computer sort of assigns orders and things like that. And you'll see the map jump around a lot as that's taking place. Eventually. <clears throat> All right, here we go. My apologies for the dead air. Um, and now it's assigning routine operations. You can kind of read this for yourself, but it does this a lot, so I tend to just hit escape, <coughs> and that speeds it up a good bit. Um, the game kind of resolves its turns, sort of like they resolve in diplomacy, if you're familiar with that. Um, each player submits their orders, and the computer computes when combat occurs, and what the results of each engagement are, and things like that. Okay, now here it's nighttime. You can see the screen sort of darken. Uh, there are friendly coast watchers at certain bases so that Japan controls, so they'll tell you when uh, enemy ships are in port. And now there's different phases of the game. This is the naval movement phase. If a task force ran into another an enemy task force, you'd see naval combat, but apparently we had none of that this turn. And here we have our amphibious task force moving in. Um, here you can see some battleships shooting at the shore. And over in this uh, little console here you can see what type of weapons they're firing. And it's uh, once again very historically uh, accurate and specific. Almost disturbingly so. Um, but I don't really care to watch the battleships just uh, keep on shooting because it's not that interesting. What you're really interested in here, I'll hit escape to uh, pass that up, is the combat report. You can see 12 coastal gunshots fired in defense, which means I'm landing almost entirely unopposed. And you can see um, enemy ground losses here. <clears throat> if I had more battleships and uh, sort of a heavier opposing force, you would see much more in the way of ground losses. And now you see um, units merging and also sometimes um, accidents happen when unloading so you might lose a few troops here or there. And I'll skip past the naval bombardment once again. And these messages that I skipped past are simply more uh, units merging. There's a lot of that, and it takes forever. And I'm short on time, actually. So um, what I'm going to do is end this video and uh, continue on with the running of a turn um, in the next video. So I'll be back in a little bit. So uh, stay tuned and check it out. <laughs>